this talk's a little different from what I planned it to be. Uh, Dave was nice enough to make the keynote last year and then suggested I do that again this year. Um, so I then scrambled until 4 a.m. trying to make my deck more keynote worthy. So it, it may come off a little bit less tactical at the beginning, but it, I promise it gets you know down to nitty gritty details pretty fast. Welcome to DerbyCon. Thank you. This is kind of awesome. So. Uh, if you haven't seen me before, my name is Dan Kaminsky. I play with a bunch of toys. Um, I've been playing with an interesting set of things lately. Let me ask you guys a question. Who here has built something? Anything? That's what I like to see. And what we also figured out was a lot of these different banks use a lot of the same platforms. And we started looking specifically at this huge world of Zeus malware. And we started saying, wow, this particular Zeus variant targets these specific banking platforms. We didn't put that together at the beginning because we saw they were only targeting such and such. This is not the talk for you. Because <laughs> there were a whole variety of awesome ways to store these things. As you can see, you can have your sexy binder. See, you'll notice, I don't have a laser pointer here, you can see on the top left the A, the mini, e the mini easel binder has a place where you can write a long story about what this 360k floppy contains on it. And it's, I mean, each binder is only 550 in 1982 dollars, so it's a bargain. You are taking this home, I know it. And I just wanted to also point out that there were ones for cassettes and for cartridges. So you can see, you know, this bad boy comes out. It's a night of entertainment on your 2600. You just pull that thing out and you're like, well, what is tonight's buffet? Presents. There's a bunch of other fun stuff we can do as well. Let's uh, interact via just a Windows command shell. Make it a little bigger. Okay, great. We'll check the road print. So, unknown to the user, we just created a new user account. Look at that. Oh, sorry, flipped over a little too fast. So we can log right into that. And this is just showing you uh, basically the power of Metasploit, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, it could be a little more malicious. Why not? Format C. Let's get rid of it. Who cares? Like I said, it's a snapshot, so we can revert right back to it. But <laughs> okay, so that is the conclusion of the Metasploit demo. I mentioned also. What were some of the most esoteric security violations that what? People reporting. Like that people were reporting. Okay, so I'm stupid. What's esoteric? Crazy. Out of the okay, so out of out of the norm, uh, the real or from the security competition? From the competition that people thought. Oh, okay. Well, uh, we got them all. We got uh, there's a light on the security alarm that wasn't there before. <laughs> that, that that's always been there. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The door made a weird sound when it opened this morning. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. When I got in, the computer was off. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. When I logged in, there was a thing that said, welcome to our network. Please review the security policy. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But the cool thing is, is that that's exactly what I wanted. And I didn't get annoyed. I didn't get irritated. I didn't say, would you guys please stop talking to me about the stupid things? Because it would have blown everything I was trying to do out of the water. I said, thank you. Yes, it is. But a lot of people started looking at stuff that they had never looked at before because they were going so fast. Every time that there was an error message, they would stop because, oh, this is a security incident. <laughs> because how many people just click OK? I mean, have you been there? Have you sat at someone's desk? OK, what's the problem? Well, I click on this and bonk, don't click. I, I need to see that. Can you do it again? Don't I bonk, click? Leave the box up so I can read the screen. So what's that basically mean? Uh, that's what it means. Um, it, it works out okay. So, uh, the, the Columbus chapter started growing to the point where I couldn't hold it in my living room anymore, even though my living room is fairly substantial. So we moved to the Columbus IP 
media thought. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that gives a happy space to be. So we grow and we grow and we grow. And lo and behold, I'm here, and that one has a box as well. So I really have to work with this presentation. I have since turned over the Thomas chapter to John Steiner, who's sitting in the back of the room. Uh, I don't know, just sitting there doing his thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Uh, and it, it just gives me a chance to spend a little bit more time with the international organization, spend a little bit more time talking to people about it. The problem with using a web browser is you may be using the wrong browser to receive the exploit. If you are being served an exploit for Windows, but you're actually using the web browser Safari, they may think it's a Mac and not give you the payload. Also, if the exploit takes advantage of the browser, it can cause your browser to crash, interfering with your analysis. It will also hide your redirection links that occur in the background, hiding the individual people that have been compromised. And naturally, if you're not sandboxed, you risk infection. <coughs> WGET and CURL are some great command line programs. They're general purpose URL, but they really don't have some of the features that we need and make our lives easier. Of course, they're not vulnerable to the JavaScript exploits, but as I said, they don't parse the link. Halfway um, and that's just for CMXs. I'm also um, looking to expand this into um, actual uh, web app frameworks. Um, so what the uh, applications themselves are built on, not just the scene messages. But that's a long way down the line. By show of hands, how many of you are responsible for defending a network? Good number of folks? Pretty much most of them? Excellent. So for those of you who didn't raise your hand, uh, would you like some more visibility into what's going on in your internet connection at home? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you've got, you know, a spouse, some kids that are just doing some random browsing on the internet, and, you know, they come to you and, Daddy, Daddy, my computer is pwned, whatever shall I do? <laughs> well, how did it happen? Let's go take a look. All right, so for those of you who are responsible for defending a network, how many of you have experience with IDS? Good number of folks. So talk to me. How do you feel? about IDS? Meh. Meh? Meh. M-E-H. Meh. You don't see a little unlock sign on the bottom. As soon as you unlock your bootloader, you get a little unlock sign. Basically what that indicates is that um, the bootloader won't let you write data to the uh, partitions or boot from a uh, uh, over the wire or anything. Uh, you basically can't do anything to the device from the bootloader. It's like a BIOS password. Uh, stock recovery partition. The stock recovery partition on the Galaxy Nexus and the Nexus 7 and, and a few of the other devices, they facilitate, uh, they basically have like a basic unit RAM FS and a few other basic things on there. They facilitate um, encrypting your device and doing all that and, and updating your device and, and doing all that because you need to have something that you can boot into to modify the file system of the main partition. Uh, and those are I mean, I don't know if they're, I mean, I guess there could be an exploit there, but if they are stock, you can't interact with them. Not a big deal. Uh, and then uh, encryption. So up until, I think it was like later in 3. something, but especially, or uh, very specifically in 4.0 and 4.1, encryption was made available where you could encrypt your phone and, uh, you know, prevent access if someone decided to steal it and uh, say that you did have a recovery partition. If your phone was encrypted, you couldn't access the data on there. Or, you know, if somebody wanted to somehow desolder the SSD chips and do all that, it's all encrypted, it doesn't matter. Um, there's also a uh, key guard. So, key guard is basically the interface you see when you type in a password or a key gesture. Why would this be a good thing in certain environments? A lot of them. And uh, a lot of them. Uh, don't allow USB flash drives, certain like uh, more secure networks, um, they, they restrict certain things. So if a plug-in flash drive, that means like, you know, we don't want exfiltration through flash drives, so we won't let them in there. But a keyboard is generally not blocked, unless all USB is blocked. If you have a desktop, you kind of need a keyboard on there. So that's generally not restricted through policy. So keyboard keystroke injection is kind of neat, and you're leveraging local stuff, so you're not necessarily having to bring anything weird on the system. It works against pretty much any computer that you can plug in keyboard. And the firmware takes care of all the running code. So 
I mentioned the environment I hope the developers follow. I'm following that and developing my functions. So I take care of all the hard stuff for you, including like, uh, so if you want to run something, like some of these payloads, I take care of the opening the run key, and opening the notepad, typing it in, running the script, completing the script. All that is done in my firmware. All you have to do is supply the payload configuration file. You don't have to worry about what weird Windows key brings up a phone. Function with all F4 that closes an application. You don't have to look all that stuff up.